Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please sit. Well, I think I drew the long straw today. I feel very privileged to be talking about my favorite subject, love. Oh, if only the world danced to the tune of love. Marriage would end in happy ever after rather than divorce. Children would grow up fulfilled and stable rather than angry or abused. And the global expenditure on war or terrorism might even be spent on feeding the hungry and housing the homeless. Now, I know this sounds like a pipe dream because it depends on humans learning to overcome their basic weaknesses, selfishness and anger. Which reminds me of this delightful domestic story, and I'm sure many of us can relate to this. A married couple had been arguing when the husband jumped up from the table, grabbed two sheets of paper, and said to his wife, let's make a list of everything we don't like about each other. The wife started writing. The husband glowered at her for a few minutes, and then he wrote on his paper. She wrote again. He watched her, and every time she stopped, he would start writing again. It was like fighting deer locking horns. They finally finished. Let's exchange complaints, Dad said. They gave each other their lists. Give mine back, the wife pleaded when she glanced at his sheet. All down the page he had written, I love you, I love you, I love you. Now, your arguments always end like that, don't they? So what kind of love can disarm or even um, disarm hatred or even murderous intent? What kind of love can stare death in the face in order to save someone else? Like a father running into a burning building to save their child. A deep-seated spiritual love at the very center of human existence that transcends petty likes and dislikes discrimination, and persecution. Instead, that deep-seated spiritual love, that peace of God placed in the center of every human being, that love offers forgiveness and reconciliation. The kind of love that God has for us. And if we reciprocate that love, the kind of love we are called to share with others. In the Gospel according to a Jewish Matthew, when the Pharisees try to trick Jesus, he responds with a provocative answer. A scribe of the Holy Law poses a common question. Which commandment in the law is the greatest, he asks. Now, there are 613 precepts of Jewish law, so if any of you think it's hard to remember 10, congratulate our Jewish brothers and sisters who remember 613 precepts. And it was common for rabbis to provide a summary for their students. Predating Jesus, the Talmud, a collection of Jewish scriptures and commentaries, recorded an answer from Rabbi Hillel. Now, Rabbi Hillel lived from approximately 110 BCE, before the Common Era, before Christ, to about 10 CE. 
and it was known as the golden rule. What is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That is the whole Torah. The rest is commentary. Go and learn it. The response from Jesus quotes Deuteronomy. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. This is the greatest and first commandment. No one could contest that answer. But that is not all. Jesus says a second commandment carries equal weight and quotes Leviticus. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. All the writings of the law and all the writings of the prophets are underpinned by these two commandments. They identify religion of the heart. Nothing in scripture can cohere or be truly obeyed unless these two are observed. Although the pairing of these two commandments did not, did not originate with Jesus, why did he consider them equally important? Because we can't acknowledge we receive God's merciful love and love God in return with our whole heart and our whole mind and our whole strength and then not love our neighbor as ourselves. To not love our neighbor is a complete denial of the love of God. When we hear it like that, it puts our pettiness in perspective, doesn't it? When we receive that love and mercy, how can we not Share that. How can we not turn our disagreements into statements of love? I love you, I love you, I love you. And how do we love our neighbor? God shows mercy. We receive mercy. We need to show mercy to others. God provides, we need to provide for others. God forgives, we receive forgiveness, we need to forgive others. That doesn't mean it's an easy path, but it's something we are called to practice until it becomes as natural within us as our love of God. Jesus also illustrated this call to action in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us as we forgive others. In other words, give your neighbor the consideration you would like to receive in their situation. Give a neighbor's interests and rights the respect you give your own. In our church, we not only live this out in our social justice engagement, but this golden rule of Jesus also informs our behavior in community through faithfulness in service, code of conduct, and the summary document, being together. If only we could remember this slogan, claiming the love of God only makes sense if we are living out that love. In the second half of the gospel reading today, Jesus has a provocative question for the Pharisees. He turns the tables. They have been asking him tricky questions to trip him up. Now he asks them a question. What 
do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? In response to their answer, which was a common answer, the son of David, Jesus quotes from one of the Psalms. Now, traditionally, Psalm 110, as with most of the Psalms, was thought to have been written by David. And Psalm 110, verse 1 says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. If David calls the Messiah Lord, how can the Messiah be David's son? Here's a great riddle for a Sunday morning. Now, this is not to deny Jesus as descending from David's line, because that is a statement that occurs very often in the New Testament. Maybe it is a comment that draws us to reflect on the kind of king the Messiah will be. Maybe the Messiah won't necessarily encapsulate the glory days of the Davidic monarchy, of King David, when national boundaries were expanded by fierce battles, where others' lands were grabbed. On the contrary, Jesus as Messiah rules not by military prowess, but by love and expects God's love to be lived out in the lives of his followers. Matthew, whose writing style criticizes the Jewish leaders for rejecting Jesus, records Jesus saying to the crowds, the scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. In other words, they know all the law. But do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. The difficult question for us today is, are we like that? Do we profess to love God but do little to show it? Could onlookers confidently say of us, do as they do. This is our challenging reflection for the week. In what social justice activities do we participate? How do we behave around people we may not initially like? With judgment or with mercy? With criticism? or with affirmation, in our family arguments? Do we show anger? Do we give anger for anger? Or do we respond with love? It is important we are brutally honest in our reflections to avoid living hypocritical lives, claiming the love of God only makes sense if we are living out that love. Let us pray. We give thanks, Lord, for the many blessings in our lives. We love you. Help us to live out your love in our daily interactions. Help us to show mercy in our dealings with others so that your presence may be visible throughout our world. Amen.